Oh, I can't see anything. Oh, hello. Okay. By popular demand, I guess. I'm gonna talk about symbols. Woo! Yay! Okay. Um, first, let me get it so people can actually see this. Sorry if I'm in a weird spot. This is the only spot with Wi-Fi right now. <laughs> okay. All right. Symbols are kind of fun. I like symbols. Um, let's see. Uh, I think basically there's a lot of ways to hold it. Um, I would suggest don't be afraid to put your hand through the strap if that's what you like because a lot of times I do this because you know it gives a little bit more I don't have to hold it as firmly and I don't have to worry about it falling as much so I have a little bit more um, freedom to do whatever I want with it so if you like putting your hand through the strap don't be afraid to do that um, I find nothing wrong with it so do it um, so you don't want to hold it too tight you want to make sure the symbol has like some play or give or whatever you want to call it. Like you don't want it to be too much either, obviously. It's a balance. Um, so yeah. Uh, the other thing is some people like to put their thumb on the bell. I personally do that. Um, I'm honestly trying to get away from it a little bit more just to free up some things. But um, you know, it, it does affect the sound a little bit, I will say that. Um, it kind of muffles the top or bottom symbol if you have your thumb on the bell. So take that into consideration. Um, I like playing dry in this hall, so it, it kind of works out in my favor a little bit. So, you know, just work with what you, what you need. Um, and then the other thing, a couple other things. Um, you might want to do this a couple times and see what position your wrists feel comfortable in. Um, I think we for, don't, don't really think about this part as much. We either have it like, like this and we just kind of go, or we have it like this and kind of go. So maybe experiment with that too. Um, honestly, I need to do more experimenting with that myself. Um, and both hands might not be the same. That's the other thing. Both hands might be this way uh, personally, I do my hands like this, so my left hand, it might be opposite for you guys, my left hand's a little bit tilted down because I, I kind of play like, like that. I play like I clap my hands, so I clap my hands this way, so that's the way I play. Um, and actually, honestly, I kind of teach people how to crash by doing that, so however you clap your hands, if you clap them like this, or like this, or like that. I usually would start them in that position and see how it feels. Personally, I clap my hands like this, so that's how I started crashing cymbals, is like that. So that's another experiment you could do. Um, yeah, so that's holding them. Um, I would also suggest when you're holding the cymbals to not forget that you have three fingers in the back. So maybe if you want to hold firmer in the back and less firm in the front, that might ease up some pressure in the front. I know that works, uh, works really well for me personally, because I, like today I'm playing a lot of cymbals in the concert, so I usually will hold it a little bit more on the bottom of the strap instead of at the top to um, relieve some of the pressure. Um, and somebody just asked a question. I want to make sure I answer it before it gets to... Hey, Josh, I'm watching the concert. Oh, hey, nice. Chris, say hi. Okay. Uh, sweet. All right. More stuff. Okay. Uh, actually, I could do this part without this. Oh, last, last thing about holding them. The position you want to hold them in as far as, like, if they're high or low or in the middle... You want to kind of see which one feels like the symbols are a part of your own body weight so they don't feel like they're too far out or to get that feeling or too far in where you got, you know. So you want something that's very balanced as far as how it feels compared to your own body weight. 
So I hold them, normally I hold them pretty low because I like playing low in general. Like I have my snare drum pretty low. I play tambourine pretty low just because I always feel grounded down here. Um, but I also have the option of playing high in the same vein because in both of these positions I feel I have control of the weight and the weight is a part of my body. So if there's multiple positions you like holding them in, you want to be able to figure out where they are so you can always find them. So personally for me, I have them um, about, about sternum height or navel height, personally. Um, <laughs> navel height is pretty easy, so you can have you know, your stomach to muffle and stuff like that. Sternum is a little trickier if you have to muffle. I usually muffle towards one side of my chest or the other side, normally my right side, if I'm up here, so you don't hit your sternum. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, things you could do without the symbols, which is kind of fun. Um, if, if people know Mark Demolakis, principal of Cleveland Orchestra, principal percussionist, Cleveland Orchestra. Um, so some things we went over were to crash in different places, not just in the same place where you're used to playing, but in different areas. So being able to like crash over here without changing like this. So you want to stay in the same stature, but you want to just move the arms around so you can extend. So that's the extension of your right arm going upward. And like, you don't have to do it this fast, but you know, just, just a general sense. So you get a sense of the entire range of motion. So when you get here, it feels super comfortable. Um, so you're just extending and extending to see how your body functions around the symbols and getting used to the symbol weight, okay? Um, and you might find that you actually crash better in a certain spot. I remember when I was taking a lesson, I ended up crashing better when my symbols were over here. And we were like, why is that? <laughs> so for the longest time, I, I was crashing symbols over here because it was real. it always came out great. So nowadays, I actually stand about this way where I'm, I'm kind of like, ta-da, and I crash everything here. So, you know, it just, it just depends on how it feels and what's comfortable and what works. So as long as it's comfortable and efficient, you should probably go with it. Um, and then if you need to make it look like, I had to make it look better because crashing like this doesn't look good, right? So you have to pay attention to that because we are being seen by the audience. So in order to make this look good, I kind of do this kind of thing, okay? So take it or leave it, you know, just an option to find more motion and extension in your crashes. Cool? Okay. Um, ways to crash. There's a lot, of, as a lot of people probably know, there's a lot of different ways to play crash symbols. A lot of people do this thing or a combination of that or the opposite. Um, some people do the opposite, going down. Um, a lot of people do uh, just a clapping motion or straight on, uh, tilted, or the other way. Um, symbols are either, um, this is my right hand, so right under left or right over left. So you can't see the other symbol, so it's like that. So there's different ways of doing that. Or you can do a combination of that where it's on the side instead of on the top or the opposite direction. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, what you should probably do, and what I did, um, you can take it or leave it, is I start dead center with the symbols completely straight together, and then I start like actually trying to put them together slowly and seeing if I can keep them from making noise. So you just want to get it to where you don't hear a lot of sounds, so you can just feel them touch, okay? And as that gets comfortable, you can start either switching one cymbal down, like that a little bit, and seeing if you can have the same effect. And then you want to kind of experiment with where where that shift happens. So if you can see, it's not really good. If, see if I can show it. 
So this one's slightly under. So I would practice that, putting them together, and seeing if that feels comfortable. And then I would just go all around the symbol. So uh, having space at the top and doing it, and slowly moving it from the top to the side, to the bottom, and to the opposite side. And whichever side I feel the most comfortable at, that's where I would probably land all of my crashes. And for me, it's, it's at the top. And for a lot of people, it's usually at the top. Um, if that doesn't work, do the same exercise, but have the, the symbol, in this case, your right symbol, over the left symbol. So it'll look like the opposite. And do the same exact thing. You want to have soft, super soft placement and seeing which side feels the most comfortable and the most flat. Um, so you don't want to hear like cut, cut, you know, you want to hear just a flat, like a hi-hat. And actually, um, this actually feels pretty comfortable, uh, right over left. Um, not as consistent as my normal one, but if I end up switching one day, maybe, I'll, I'll probably go to that, okay? So that's one way of figuring out like what area is most comfortable for you to start crashing in on a regular basis. Um, and that's, kind of, that's actually a Chris Slam technique or practice technique, um, crashing in different spots. Uh, so you have 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3, and going all around the, in the clock. Okay, so that's, that's actually a really good exercise to get used to the whole range of the symbol. So you're not just focusing on the first part of the crash. Okay? Um, take a little break here. I know there's, let's see, did anybody write a question? I think, I think that's, I think that was the only one. Okay, cool, sweet. Hopefully I'm doing a decent job at this. Okay. Um, so like I said, I usually start, when I started crashing, I started dead center and being in this position, I felt a lot of strain on my back, on my lower back especially. So what I started doing is switching to see like, if I felt better in a certain angle. So you could, you could also do this. I usually do this before every concert, like this kind of thing. Just to loosen up my forearms and get my, just get my arms a little loose and my wrists a little loose. So I would suggest doing, once you find the crash spot, start actually trying to just do that and then see if there's another position as far as the angle of the symbol that'll work too. Um, so for me, it's really hard to do, the, oh, that was, that was decent, but it's, it's really hard for me to get a solid crash in this position. So I started experimenting with right under the left, so right hand, this is my right hand, under the left hand, or vice versa, right hand over the left hand, and I found it was a lot more comfortable on my back and as far as like my balance if I held them this way. So again, you want to make sure you test every single option that you have, basically. <laughs> Not every single option, but you know what I mean. Just test a lot of options and see which one fits your comfort, okay? And you just want to feel like you're, you're at home. You don't want to feel like I'm, I have a pair of cymbals and I need to hold them very, you know, you know. You want to feel at home wherever you are with the cymbals, okay? All right. Speaking of home, okay, so I remember I said I taught people how to crash cymbals through clapping. So the way I crash and the way I was taught to crash is basically like stick control. You have a right stick and a left stick. So you have like... You can do full strokes with the right hand. So that's a stroke, and then you have down strokes. There's actually a really great video uh, Mark Demolakis put out with Zildjian. It's on YouTube. I'll probably link it when this, when this is over. It's a great video. He goes through all the stroke types. So I, I highly recommend you watch that video because it's excellent. Okay, so Reader's Digest version. You have full strokes with one hand and full stroke. And then you have full strokes with the other hand. And you want to make sure that it doesn't stop or else it becomes a downstroke. So you don't want it to stop. You want it to have a complete stroke motion. Cool? So you have a full. 
and they have downstrokes, and the downstrokes bounce, so you don't want to feel like you're doing that. You want to just feel like a weighty drop and it bounces in a tap position, okay? And you have a downstroke and it, and it rebounds. So you see it rebounds back into tap position. So this is a great way to practice without the cymbals, just in a way that you usually clap. So if you clap like that, or if you clap like this, so that's a really, if you can do that without the cymbals, then just do the same exact motion with the cymbals, okay? Keyword, same. <laughs> So don't change the motion just because you have a big metal plate in your hand. So this is, that's the way your arm is going to move and respond. Just do the same thing except you have a, a big sheet. So it just does the same thing with more weight. Okay, so we, we did down strokes. Then you have tap strokes, so mini full strokes. Same motion. Um, and then up strokes. So, so you're dropping from a tap position and lifting up. So don't go... Make sure you're dropping from a tap position. Okay? So I'll just do it again. So dropping from the tap position. In this, in this hand, you're coming up <laughs> from a tap position, but you get it. Okay, so don't go, don't have like a prep for the tap. Just drop. So that's your upstroke. So you have all your basic strokes, and you just play with that with the cymbals. Okay? And then after that, you can start, uh, instead of just doing one hand at a time, you could do them both. So in this case, I would probably do, show you in a second. What you're going to do, you're going to basically rebound the opposite symbol out of the way, like that. The key is you don't want to, like, you don't want to have, like, a, you don't want to try to come up before it hits. So you want to make sure it does that and then leaves. So you can do the same exercise from before and stop and then let go, stop. Just so you can see and feel where they meet, okay? So you're trying to memorize the pathway to them meeting. And you want to make sure you're not like trying to force a pathway. You want to make sure you just feel the weight dropping into the cymbal, okay? You don't want to feel like you're going like that. You want to just make it like, just drop into your motion. And the same thing for the other one, okay? So it's a two-handed instrument. You want to make sure both hands are engaged. So I'll scoot back so you can. So that's, that's, you know, just doing like the pendulum thing. And you can do that the same, I have an Instagram video where I do this in all different types of like positions. So move like literally I'm kind of doing like that <laughs> just to get a really full motion. But when you do that, make sure you're not tense in, in the fingers and in your wrist or else you're going to get pops all over the place. So you want to make sure your wrist and your fingers are loose enough to keep the symbol Nimble, symbol nimble. <laughs> okay. So whenever, if you go that far, which I recommend, but don't do it until you're ready to go that far. Get it right here first, and then expand. Um, for some people, it might be the opposite. Uh, there are some things where you'll have to expand first and then diminish to get the feel. So figure out um, with caution which version is going to work for you. If you need to go big first, make sure you have earplugs and stay loose in the hands before you do that. And if you have to go small first, you know, just make sure you're also loose in the hands and in the wrists and just know when you'll start tensing if that happens, okay? If you start getting bigger. For me, when I started getting bigger, I started getting tenser, so I had to go back to a softer version and just mitigate that tension. So. Just, you know, be aware of your body and how it's responding to the new motions and how wide they are. Okay? Um, let's see. Anybody got a, there's a lot of, there's eight people. Does anybody have a question? I talked a lot, but <laughs> I'll keep talking if no one types the question. Um, okay. 
Let's see. Oh, stick control again. You can do like stick control exercises if you want. So I like doing paradiddles a lot. Comes in handy for some excerpts. Um, like Night on Bald Mountain, I do, uh, let's see. I do a downstroke right hand. So that's the big pop. Let's see. Actually, it's the opposite. I do a left hand. Okay. So for Night on Bald Mountain, I do a left hand downstroke and it pushes the right hand out, right? Okay, then I do the fast eighth notes. So cha, ching, 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 cha, cha. And that's what I do. So cha, cha, ching, 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 cha, cha, cha. So, because this one's be the more nimble one. So I kind of... So that's what I do. <laughs> also, these are some these are some uh, old Zildjian's. I, we don't know how old these are, but they're really like very broad. I wonder if these are um, maybe prototypes of the classic orchestras because they have a similar. Similar weight and feel, so these might be like classic orchestral prototypes or something. I gotta ask around. They sound really good. Um, it's like a really dark, broad sound. Okay. Um, short crash. Oh, kind of on that vein. Short crashes um, are just regular crashes that are short. Avoid tension. Trying to like you know power out a short crash. Okay. So I would, what I had to do, literally, I had to do a broad crash that was a downstroke and then muffle. And then do the same thing and then after a while it would move the muffle closer. So let's say I did a whole note and then I would muffle on the next downbeat. Then I would do a dotted half note, then a, then a muffle at the next quarter and you see where it goes. And I would do it with both hands separately, and then with both hands together, and then eventually I get to an eighth note and then a sixteenth. But the key is you want to make sure that the crash feels like you're doing a normal crash, and then muffling afterwards, and not feel like you're doing something completely different. Because that's what I ended up doing for a while, so I had to change that whole thing. Okay? So, to uh, demonstrate, I would do... So eventually you get into that feel. Um, and after a while, my hands are getting tired. After a while, once you, uh, let's see, once you get really used to that, the muffle almost becomes a part of that motion. So when you have to go really quick and uh, like, check four. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Eighth note, so that's, a, that's an eighth note rest and then you have long notes after. So we're doing track four, uh, fourth movement today. Uh, so like, uh, so it just, it just becomes part of the motion after a while, as long as it stays the same. So if the motion always stays the same, it's easy to go from one thing to the next. If you, if you change your motion, it's gonna be hard to update it and react. Cool? Oh, hi Bridget. Cool. That's short notes. Short notes of the heart, well, at least for me, they were really hard. I was really good at broad, like just wah notes. Um, speaking of wah, how do you get a wah sound? Okay, so, or cha. Uh, there's a lot of different terms people use. Um, have your own list of terms, just so you know, or have a sense of what kind of sound you want. So there's like, for me, it's a ching, 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 ching. That's more high, it's a little bit more articulate. Cha is a little broader, uh, darker sound, warmer. Uh, 
maybe more downstroke. I think Shang would be more upstroke and taps. Uh, and then you just have like the broad waz, like you see people do this. We're back. <laughs> the Wi Fi is really kind of weird here. Okay, so yeah, so you have like a wah sound. So, ways to manipulate that is through speed, weight, as in the weight of the symbols. So, speed of your motion, weight of the symbols, the amount of offset. So, the offset we talked about. Um, so, the more offset you get, the more and the wider your crash. Um, it's going to get a lot more of that non-articulate sound. So you're going to get like a very wide, like so if you have just a little bit of offset, you get a more articulate one. That was a pop, sorry. Okay, and if you widen what I mean flam, so normally you have a symbol crashing it so that this hits first. So the wider that space is, the wider your crash is going to be. So normally, I really, I really try not to mess with that because the way your motion is going to be naturally, it's going to naturally come in, at least for me personally, it comes in like that anyway before it touches the bottom. So you want to be aware of that. When you're playing this way, it's less likely to do that. It's, it's going to come more like straight on. So you want to make sure you actually have a space at the bottom. I can't see my bottom, so. <laughs> cool? So the wider that space is, the wider the crash is going to be. So the less articulate it's going to be, too. Cool? So you can mess with that. Um, and you want to start messing with that once you have a solid articulate crash before you start messing with the angle, okay? So get a good crash first and then start widening the angle and then maybe even slowing down your speed also helps. So when I, whenever I do a wide crash, I usually crash from very slow. <laughs> maybe not that slow, but you get the idea. And it, it slowly does that. So I usually go And there's a bunch of different variations on that. So uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of different things you could do. There's so many different styles of a wall, like that splashy, non-articulate crash. Uh, if you're in Pittsburgh and hear um, either, oh, if you hear uh, Jeremy Branson play cymbals and you hear a wah crash, he does this like slide thing, which is really cool, but I can't duplicate the same way. Like, he does this thing where he whips his right hand like that, and his left hand kind of just leads into it, like, like a regular crash. So it's like this weird, it's like that, which I cannot duplicate the same way. Um, the way I do that kind of crash, I literally kind of slide my cymbal into the next one by like, that was a bad version, but I slide it in. So there's a lot of different things you can do. And this is why you want to practice, like, mess around with different movements, because there are some crashes you'll find just by practicing different areas that you'll be like, oh, that sounds like I could use that sound somewhere. Or, you know, you'll just find different techniques and different sound worlds that you can experiment with and use. So now I have, now I have a bunch of different crashes. I have the regular articulate one. Uh, a normal wah, and if I need it to be longer and kind of, you know, just really no articulation at all, now I have that like almost no. Let's see if I can do it. It's like. Yeah, so it's, al it's like almost no articulation. And it's, it's really cool. Sometimes it's not as reliable. <laughs> so. Unless I'm absolutely sure that it's going to come out, I won't do it. <laughs> but, like, it's, it'll be cool one day if I can actually use it at a concert. That'd be awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, crash course and crash course in crashing symbols, I guess. Um, yeah, anything else? 
Uh, practice like five minutes a day, you know, get the strength in your hands. You don't want to overdo it. And I would, pra I would probably start small, you know, practicing with like 16s, light 16s, like classic orchestral 16s, Zildjian. <laughs> um, and then leading up from there, getting 17s, 18s, 19s, 20s, 21s, 22s. I would highly recommend practicing on 22s. I, I know it's rough, but it's really helpful. Just having that massive weight and having to navigate it without being tense, it really, you know, it makes you have to relax or else you're gonna always get a bad crash. Okay, so start with 16s. If you have a pair of 22s, lead up to that and do really slow crashes. Don't try to go for it. Just Practice really slow with those 22s just to feel how much weight there is and what you have to do. Because when I'm now when I'm playing 22s, I have to be out like almost like this. So how do I balance my own weight to this? You know, so it's it's a really interesting um, dynamic that you have to adjust to. Cool. Okay, and it's I mean it's symbols. It's it's a different animal than everything else in in itself because these are big metal sheets that we have to like somehow meet together without being completely flat and you know work on our motion to make sure they're not too fast or if you get a really bad like rough aggressive crash and not too slow so they don't like not advocate activate the other symbol things like that um yeah anybody let's see who's still here i can't see we have three people hey gabe Hi, Gabe. <laughs> um, yeah. I can't think of anything else. I think I, that's all the stuff I usually talk about in lessons. Um, oh, stance. Um, you don't want to be, you want to just feel like you're comfortable. Um, you want to make sure that you're comfortable and stable without having to make yourself stable. So for me, I have, like I said, I stand like, like this. You can't see my feet, but my right foot is basically like this, and my left foot is slightly tilted this way, so I'm standing like that. Other people do a similar thing, except they stand straight on with the right foot in front of the other, or the left foot in front of the other. I haven't seen many people stand with their feet completely uh, shoulder width apart. Um, not to say that that's not a good way or a bad way to do it. If it feels stable and you're able to do everything freely, that's great. You're just trying to find a place where you feel like you're not having to hold yourself up. Okay, so you want to feel like you're always in a position where you can just like sit where you're standing, basically. Standing while sitting or sitting while standing. Um, so I would experiment with that too. There's a lot of things you can experiment with. So. I would take the time and test a lot of things out before you set on a, on a specific thing. Unless you find something that's just like, oh, that's, that works, great. You know, if it's efficient and feels good, work with that. But still experiment, because you never know what's out there sometimes. Cool? Um, all right. That's symbols for you. Uh, like I said, we're playing, what are we playing tonight? We're playing Romeo and Juliet, Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet, and we're doing uh, the fourth movement of Tchaik 4, and then we're doing movements from Swan Lake, the suite. I think we're doing the, the scene four, the valse, and the 29, scene 29, the finale, and lastly, we're doing, I'm forgetting one, oh, Variations on a, a Rococo theme. And yeah, everybody sounds great. And very happy to be here. <laughs> I'm playing a lot of cymbals. I'm playing cymbals on Romeo and Shike 4 and Swan Lake. And my friend Malcolm's playing cymbals on uh, Capriccio Italien. I forgot about that. We're doing Capriccio Italien as well, uh, which is awesome it sounds great <laughs> i'm playing tambourine on that it's like really fun um yeah everybody sounds awesome it's great yeah so 
Uh, anyone has any questions or comments? Comment in the comment section. And yeah, we'll do this again soon. Well, maybe not symbols, but we'll do some. I'll do another video and post it on Facebook afterwards. Cool. Sweet. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you guys very soon. Bye.